Hello, everyone. Thank you for your patience. Uh, that's on me. I'm Eric. I'm your admin. Welcome to session 38 with the Professor Bud with Professor Buzzkill of the Professor Buzzkill History Podcast, uh, who's going to be taking over in just a minute now on the following talk. So it turns out Gandhi never said, be the change you wish to see in the world. A New York City teacher and social reformer did. But practically no one knows her name and her work. Maya Angelou never said, a bird sings because it has a song. A children's book author was inspired by an African-American poet to write that. In this presentation, Professor Buzzkill, Dr. Joseph Kuhill, um, explains how these and many other famous quotes are attributed to already famous people and how this process obscures the breadth of wisdom in our culture. Too many inspirational voices are hidden by our soundbite society and we are poorer for it. Dr. Kuhill, Professor Buzzkill, thank you so much. I'll leave it to you. Thanks for having me on the show. It's great. And I hope that everyone is enjoying the fact that because of Zoom and because of COVID, ironically, we can actually have more people come on the on the conference and, and more people talk. And that's sort of the theme of what I'm trying to say today is that in our culture and especially in our soundbite culture and on our media culture and in our we want a simple answer culture, we all too quickly have fallen into the trap of taking expressions given by relatively unknown people and attaching them to the names of famous people. This happens all the time. We address them on our on the Professor Buzzkill History Podcast and in a little segment we call Quote or No Quote. And that's a problem, I argue, for a couple of reasons. One, I get kind of PO'd that people don't get the proper credit that they deserve. And under that, I would say they, they don't get the credit for the, the hard work that they've been doing, usually surrounding not only that quote, but the 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 organization they've been involved in or the social change they've been involved in or the piece of literature they were working on or things like that. And so Gandhi and Churchill and Lincoln and Einstein and almost everyone else, so you can imagine that would go on a, on a Mount Rushmore of misquotation, get credited with these famous quotes. And I think the most prominent one that you see on social media because it's a very meaningful thing to say and it means and, and, it, and if you actually put it into practice it might work and it's a very hopeful thing to say optimistic thing to say is be the change you wish to see in the world now this is attributed to Mahatma Gandhi who uh, is I believe the Mahatma of misquotation next to Churchill more quotes are misattributed to Gandhi than almost anybody else Gandhi was a very highly prolific writer. He's a very highly prolific speaker. He's one of the most intelligent men of the 20th century. All his utterances were written down, recorded. Uh, his speeches were worked on very carefully, right? There are many drafts of them. So Gandhi, like Churchill, is one of those people about whom we know a great deal of what they were thinking, right? And how they expressed themselves. And we have records of this. Well, he never really said that. So, all right, big deal. He, technically, he never said that, but he said things like it, Professor. This is what I. This is one of the criticisms I always get. And yes, that's sort of true, but they're very vague, and they deal with sort of the spiritual world rather than the practical world of society where we want reform and change to happen. So, let me give you what Gandhi actually said. Right, and this was in a passage about the natural world and the dangers of the natural world and specifically about the dangers of the jungle, okay, the Indian jungle. And there was a certain passage, believe it or not, in here where he's talking about tigers and how relationships between humans and wild tigers can be improved. He says, we but mirror the world, all the tendencies present, all the tendencies present in the outer world are to be found in the world of our body. This is the divine mystery supreme, a wonderful thing it is, and the source of our happiness. Now he goes on to talk at length, at great length, great philosophical length, about how if and when a person is able to change their internal selves, that will have an effect on the natural world. But it's very, very spiritual, as I say, it's very metaphysical, and it's not at all like what we have, see attributed to him be the change you wish to see in the world. Be the change you wish to see in the world is sort of a direction, sort of marching orders, saying go, go out and 
not only try to affect the change that you want to see happen, but be, be the change yourself. Make yourself part of the change and make yourself representative of the change. So who said it? Well, very interestingly, it's from a Brooklyn high school teacher named Arlene Lawrence in 1970. Okay? There are a few different versions of, of the way she said it. She was creating something called the Love Project, which was an idea and an initiative to sort of improve the neighborhood around the high school where she taught. This is Thomas Jefferson High School in Brooklyn, which was in a rough neighborhood at that time. And everything from walking to school to how things happen on the playground to how students and teachers interacted with people in the neighborhood, Ms. Lawrence thought, was an opportunity to improve society, right? So she tried to inculcate this thing called the Love Project again, and, and there are a few different original versions of how, how Be the Change is expressed. 1970, she wrote in the initial Love Project's original principles, be the change you want to see happen instead of relying, instead of trying to change anyone else. Another way that that's been reported is the, 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 the Love Project and how it works was, of course, analyzed in many academic educational studies, academic journals. And a, a version of the quote comes up in one of those studies is one way to start a preventative program, and this is preventive of violence and preventive of disorder in the neighborhood, is to be the change you want to see happen. That was attributed to Ms. Lawrence. And I think actually the, the best, the most effective distillation of what she said was actually said by her later in 1974, when she said one way to start a preventative program is to be, and she underlined an emphasis, emphasized this every time she wrote, every time she spoke it, the change you wish, wish to see happen. That is the essence and substance of the simple and successful endeavor of the Love Project. That's how she explained it in an education textbook. Now, this, of course, was analyzed throughout the country. The, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, for instance, picked it up in 1976 and expressed it as be the change you, you want to see happen instead of trying to change anyone else. And the Love Project, from all evidence of the New York school system, worked actually very well at Thomas Jefferson High in Brooklyn. And Ms. Lawrence went on to uh, when she, she moved to San Diego later in the 1970s and she taught there and tried to teach the same principles to um, in the San Diego school district and various colleges around Southern California. And to make a long story short, these places were more or less transformed from a uh, center of violence and hostility to a place where at least people and all people, including the, the school children, the teachers, the administrators, the security guards, the school bus drivers were trying to create a place of love and caring where learning could actually occur, okay? Again, I wanna stress that the essential difference between what Gandhi said, which is we but mirror the world, is that they dealt with the spiritual and the met metaphysical realms and planes. Arlene Lawrence's Be the Change deals with practical change you, and, and the necessity of taking action personally and immediately. Now, it isn't really until the internet starts going in the late 80s that someone uh, sees this quote in an educational textbook and starts putting it around. You often saw them way back when, in the early days of email, as a quote at the bottom, and that's all it was, right? They didn't put Arlene Lawrence because no one knew who Arlene Lawrence was. She continued to work in the in, in, on the front lines, if you will, of education reform and, so, and social reform, very admirably, I might add. We talked to her on the show about this, but we'll, uh, I don't want to boost the show too much. Uh, but because it was unattributed in, in this most sort of this first blast of email, people eventually started saying, "Well, who said that?" Well, it, you know. It sounds like Gandhi, it's probably Gandhi. And so when later internet uh, platforms started, such as Facebook, Gandhi's name got attached to this and on and on and on and on and on it went, okay? This is, the very, this is a very, very common pattern in misattributed quotations. We don't know where a quote, quote comes from, but if it sounds vaguely spiritual, but also a little bit, you know, improving the world, then we put Gandhi's name on it. If it sounds 
inspirational and a way to live your life vigorously and fully and and and, and protect yourself during a war that we attribute to, to Churchill, even though he may have never said it. Folksy wisdom, no matter where it comes from, gets attributed to Mark Twain, right? Even though all these things have, um, almost all these things, especially the famous ones, have origins in other people. The other one I want to mention is, is one that maybe got even more sort of official <laughs> recognition, and that is, uh, or more official promotion, that is my my Angelou saying, saying, a bird sings because it has a song. Okay. Now, this originally starts off as a bird sings, as a bird doesn't sing because it has an answer, it sings because it has a song. And it's it's one of the best known expressions of artistic, uh, the intrinsic intrinsic nature of art and beauty. It's been quoted by presidents. It's been quoted by school teachers and practically everybody in between. And we all know that this quote comes from Maya Angelou because it's all over the internet that it comes from Maya Maya Angelou. Okay, and Maya Angelou obviously is one of the most important poets of our time. 2015. So, so by the way, this takes this takes more or less the same internet process that the quote I just mentioned from Gandhi did uh, earlier. This is the same process through the early internet. Well, then in 2015, the United States Post Office issued a stamp honoring Maya Angelou as one of the most important poets of our time. And it put the, a bird doesn't sing because it has an answer, it sings because it has a song, quote, next to her portrait on the stamp. Now, not only did she never say this, she never claimed it as her own. The quote actually comes from Joan Walsh Angeland, who was a children's book author, who wrote it in a book of poetry uh, called A Cup of Sun in 1967. And her quote was, a bird doesn't sing because it has an answer, he sings because he has a song. Now, this got, people pointed this out, including Miss Angeland, and the post office said, well, yes, uh, we're sorry for the misattribution, but she's, she's sort of connected with this phrase, so we're going to keep it. Right? They didn't pull the stamps. They didn't stop printing them. And that's, again, that's sort of why that this misquotation process keeps going, right? No one bothers to say, well, it's actually this other person. Okay? This is, was helped by the fact that this quote is attributed to Maya Angelou because her famous 1969 autobiography was entitled, right, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings. Well, that quote doesn't come from Maya Angelou either. She adapted that quote from a 19th century uh, poet named Paul Lawrence Dunbar. because She was searching for a title that effectively encapsulated the nature of her story, the nature of her, her life. And she so she turned to this poem, which was called Sympathies, published in 1899 uh, by uh, Paul Dunbar, again, who's a very important late 19th century poet, forgotten now largely, and the child of slaves. Uh, Dunbar died in 1906. His, his poetry wasn't uh, widely spread afterwards, although it was read in a lot of literature classes, but that was about it. You know, it didn't, it doesn't go out like Emily, uh, po uh, like Emily Dickinson or, or other famous writers in, in, in the American 20th century. And you, you, you sort of get the, the, the essence of why Maya Angelou chose this quote to put in as a title of her book when you read the first stanza of the poem. And I, and I apologize for my lack of poetic skills, but I'll read it to you. This is, again, this is Sympathy by Paul Lawrence Dunbar from 1899. I know why the cage bird sings, alas, when the sun is bright on the upland slopes, when the wind stirs soft through the springing grass and the river flows like a stream of glass. And the first birds sing and the first bud opens and the faint perfume from its chalice steals. I know what the cage bird feels. Now, again, you can be kind of nitpicky like I am, and say, well, Dunbar deserves the credit for all this, and of course he does. But I think what's interesting is the is that how the idea moves through the various layers, if you will, of cultural understanding, and eventually comes to be attributed to Maya Angelou. That's the process that interests 
historians. But, uh, and, so, but and, and it gives us a chance to, to say to people, well, actually, that's not a Maya Angelou quote, but here, here's Paul Dunbar wrote this. Go read his stuff, and maybe somebody will. Okay, uh, Dunbar's ideas lived on, of course, in Maya Angelou's work, of course, in James Baldwin's work, of course, in the work of others. And I encourage all of you to read him. But also, please read uh, Joan Walsh Anglin's children's poems in A Cup of Sun, in the, the, the poetry collection called A Cup of Sun. Read it to your kids as they're going off to sleep. And then you can tell them this little story about how quotations, quotations change and and mutate and become misattributed when they're a little older. So I am I want to leave it there and then ask for questions because we um, the people are always asking about quotations and they're almost always misattributed. And I love busting them with the, with, the, with the idea that I'm not just busting them for the hell of it. I'm busting and trying to show that there are these hidden voices that need to be uncovered and need to be promoted. I love how so, I love how on theme this has been. Um, oh, and, wow, right. and we've actually got some um, we've actually got some some questions already. Everyone else, feel free to pile in. The way to do it is there is an ask a question button at the bottom center, um, and you can click that and and pop your questions in. So we've got we've got our first question here, um, which is one of my favorite quotes is quote I apologize for the length of this letter. Had I more time, it would have been shorter. I've seen this attributed to Twain, of course, but also Pascal. Any insight on where that one happened to come from? I think, well, first of all, don't quote me. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> yeah, that one really floors Lady Buzzkill over dinner. Uh, the, the, I think it's Pascal, and I think it's phrased a little differently in French. But what I want to do also in this session is to say you really should look at three things. Well, more, maybe more than three things. Wiki quote. Right, w i k i q u o t e dot com has is excellent in this and has a great search bar and it's very very deeply researched and and um, and scholarly. The other thing is the Yale Book of Quotations by Paul Shapiro. That's a great place. That's a great reference work. There's the Quote Investigator by Garson O'Toole. That's a that's a website called QuoteInvestigator dot com. And what I like about that is that. He not only tells you where the quote from is, he then gives the, the chronology of how the quote, as I say, bubbles up through different forms of literature and then changes and is attributed to other people. Uh, and and it, it's just a great resource. So there are all, you know, no one can ever prove that Mark Twain didn't say that, but there's no record of him saying it. Okay. It's just, there's, and there's awful, um, if it is Pascal, almost certainly it is, there's an awful lot of evidence that Pascal did say it. So what I encourage people to do is to look at these sources. It, it takes all of four minutes at most. The Quote Investigator is a great website. WikiQuote is a, is a great website. And then and having these quotation books on your shelves, the Yale Book of Quotation, and the Oxford Book of Quotations is good as well. It, it just gives you two, you know, just a brief moment to look at and say, oh, no, there's something deeper. There's something better about this. But every time you hear Churchill, every time you hear Gandhi, every time you hear Lincoln, every time you hear Twain, it's almost always, I can almost always say before you ask me that it's, it's not, it's misattributed, which makes me, again, a tremendous hit at parties. <laughs> um, sorry. Um, uh, okay, we've got another question <laughs> um, uh, that... That says uh, it challenges your challenges your thesis a little bit, actually. So yes. this question goes: Could it be a good thing that some unknown people's amazing quotes get attributed to more famous folks, as they would thereby get amplified and have more opportunity to touch our hearts? Yes. I, did you say punch our heart or touch our hearts? Touch. Touch. I, well, I think I think you're absolutely right. But for this reason, one of the other sort of. Um, Missions behind the Buzzkill Institute is to tear down this side to try to help tear down this idea of hero worship and that only one individual, for instance, won World War II or one individual freed India. And one of the things that you can talk about when it, when it comes to quotes like this is you can say, all right, Arlene Lawrence, I mean, sorry, Gandhi didn't say this, Arlene Lawrence said it, but underlying all that is the most important thing, which, which your, what was the questioner's name? 
We actually don't have a name okay. for this one. Right. I don't know why. Well, yeah. Well, well, questioner, <laughs> one of the one of the strengths of what you're saying is that uh, what we try in the at the institute always to stress is it's the sentiment that matters. It's not necessarily that it's it, it's when we won't uh, you know be the change you wish to see in the world. No one would argue against that. It's a wonderful sentiment to have. The fact that it's not Gandhi is more a, a process of cultural appropriation and the cultural laying on of this hero worship. Well, it has to be Gandhi. It has to be FDR. It has to be Einstein. Einstein never said that thing about the bees disappearing and then the humans will disappear, despite the fact that you see it on, on cable news all the time. The, but there is a real question. What happens if the bees disappear? So yes, I agree with you that the sentiment is the most important thing. And it's the sentiment that needs to be out there in, in almost all these cases. But I just get a little angry for the people who were, you know, uh, not angry, but I get a little frustrated for the people who don't get credit for stuff that they do. And Arlene Lawrence is thankfully still with us and still teaches these principles uh, around the country. So um, I agree with you. I agree with you. But if it weren't for quote misattributions, you know, we wouldn't have much of a show. And uh, right now <laughs> I'm rolling in the cash because of my podcast. So it's a way for me to make bank as the, as the young buzz killers say. So uh, speaking of buzz killers, uh, yeah. you mentioned, so you had mentioned the Buzzkill Institute. Someone asked, uh, just what is the Buzzkill Institute? Tell us more. It's my dining room table. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, it's just, the, it's, it's the, I'm, I'm telling all of you intelligent speech people, but keep it a secret. It's just the joke that we make up about the, the fact that there's this podcast and the research that goes on behind it. Uh, but we, you know, it, for instance, this is literally coming from my dining room table because the light is better in here than anywhere else. And we record the podcast at our, at our dining room table. What we refer to having a research team and research division of the Buzzkill Institute and things like that, but it's <laughs> it's all it's all made up. It's just cool. here. <laughs> but 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 like this thing about attributing quotes to famous people in different. I I almost none of the work that I do for Professor Buzzkill is original. I rely on the work of serious scholars, other people. Who have done really the digging and the discovering of all these things? It is I'm sort of, as I say, you know, making bank from it. So speaking of all this research, uh, we've got another mm -hmm. question that goes. Um, oh, where was it? It moved. Ah, here we go. Um, so you've got a bunch of books on the shelf behind you. Of all those, which are the one or few that we should be reading? None and of why? them. None of them. None of them. The, the reason why the ones are that are behind me are all from my specialty field when I was doing my PhD and when I was a research historian way back when. Oh, there's probably a good one. There's a one called uh, Modern Times and uh, Places by Peter Conrad. That's very good. Uh, hang on. Well, I can't, I can't do it without probably crashing. Uh, and there, are, there are a number of important history books, but, there, but these are really highly specialized and for most people would be very boring and might even seem to be you know a little bit um, unnecessary. However, just as a as an example, we happen to be working, and by we, I mean me. Again, I, I, I fall into this trap. Pardon me for one second. <coughs> I'm putting out a show next week on the second wave of the 1918 pandemic, mm. because we seem to be either in the at the end of our first wave now, or, or, or the fact that the, the, pand the pandemic is still going up, or we're about ready to get hit by a very bad second wave in the fall. So a book that I've been working on, one of many books that I work on that, that go on that show is by John Barry, which is called The Great Influenza Pandemic of 1918. And I strongly recommend people read that book, especially American buzz killers, because it is very bracing and it'll tell you exactly what happened in 1918 and the, the, the parallels between how the people in the United States in 1918 reacted to the pandemic and the way we're reacting now to the pandemic are shocking. And that remember the 1980 flu pandemic killed more people than World War I. And we're doing the same thing now that we did then. And we, we, everyone knows it was a failure back then. We don't need to be doing it right now. So I recommend that. John Barry, the, the, great, uh, the great flu or the great influence. I can't remember which one. Let me... Uh... There we go. I've written that down so it's in, in the chat so that everyone... B-A-R-R-Y, I think. Oh, B-A-R-R-Y. Excuse me. Uh, yeah, I can probably find it on Amazon.com. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I recommend it very highly, but it is very bracing and very upsetting, frankly. Uh, it's, you know, it, I every time I read it and every time I thought, oh, no, that love, you know, we're not doing anything about, like, we're, we're doing exactly what Barry's telling us uh, not to do, and the same exact thing is going to happen. Awesome. Because, because you know, what as they post. always say in the ESPN world, Whenever, whenever you're coming up against Mother Nature, you know, take Mother Nature and lay the points. It's always going to win. So I just put the link. I just put the link for the Barry book on the chat. Cool. Thank you. Um, yep, that is the one. So uh, we have actually. So, so uh, Professor Buzzco, your your um, your talk was a little was fairly short, so you didn't chew mm -hmm. up anything close to your total your total time. And uh, we had four questions that we that. You've burned through efficiently already. What I want to do is give everyone in the audience um, an opportunity to ask a few more questions and to um, uh, to fill the space, or rather, to like make that time while they're cooking mm -hmm. up questions useful. Um, what what I'm sure everyone wants to know that that I that I always ask when I'm uh, when I'm admitting a talk is where can people get more Professor Buzzkill or just Dr. Kuhill in their lives. Uh, you can't have any more Dr. Kuhil in my life. In your my life, Lady Buzzkill keeps me on a short leash. You can get all of Professor Buzzkill at professorbuzzkill.com. We are on all podcast platforms: Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, everything. We're in 140 countries in the world, and we have listeners in 140. Sorry. <coughs> uh, yes, uh, podcatcher. Every every sort of good podcast platform has us. I do not recommend reading my own historical research because it's very narrow and it deals with Britain and Ireland in the 1830s and 1840s. So it's uh, it's uh, one of the reasons I wanted to branch out <laughs> into podcasting so I could actually talk to, to real people. But do we, uh, our blog is on, on professorbuzzkill.com. That's how the episodes are sort of elaborated and explained more. The different types of episodes we have long miss quotes. We have Man Crush Monday and a Woman Crush Wednesday shows that come out, people who deserve more attention. We're really big, we, again, was, I keep saying we because I'm used to saying it now, but I'm really big on and on, on wanting to promote people who who are, have been steamrolled out of history by the, the desire just to Churchillize everything or to FDRize everything or to Gandhiize everything. Uh, the reason I my my talk was kind of short is because I thought this was a round table and I only had ten minutes. Oh ten minutes no! Place. Oh, that uh, no, I'm I am merely I am merely your admin. Um, oh, so okay. I I I fear to say I, fear I thought the training say, yesterday they said I thought the training they said I was part of a of a of a panel with the ancient history fangirl group and that. That's you may me. you may be later. Um, I I suggest getting in touch with Ray or Ben. Uh, but this this one is your time. Oh, okay. Well, then I'm here for everything. I I, I can tell you. I I, I mean, again, <laughs> like I say, I bore Lady Buskill's social set crazy with my discussions of uh, discussions of historical myths from everything from the what, especially what comes up in movies. And movies are perhaps the worst um, source of historical misunderstanding and the worst cause of what we don't understand. Well, for instance, one of the things that's happening right now, and I happen to be going on Belfast TV tomorrow about it, is there's this there's this thing called the Irish slaves myth that's running around. It appears in social media every time there's a sort of there, there are periods of tape, right, racial tension in the United States, and it's a myth that Irish people were enslaved in the late 1600s and 1700s and sent to the Caribbean under the British Empire, and that essentially we Irish people, Irish people, Irish Americans don't complain and moan. Why are black people complaining and moaning about how they've been treated? Why do we have to have, uh, uh, why are they asking for reparations? The Irish people never got reparations. Well, the Irish people not reparations because the Irish, the, because the Irish people were never enslaved. It was called indentured servitude and it's wildly different from chattel slavery, which is what African Americans, Africans coming over to the colonies, and then African Americans in the United States suffered from, and that's an it's a whole other thing. It's a whole magnitude of of awfulness worse than 
than indentured servitude. And again, I have a show that just came out about that. It's called The Irish Slaves Myth. So I want to plug that. And it's very upsetting because it uh, people believe it. And they, they virulently believe it. And I'm called all sorts of names and including by uh, relatives of mine, external uh, extended family relatives of mine, because I'm a traitor to my Irish American heritage and stuff like this. But it's just not true. And it just, by continuing to promote it around the internet just increases the hate and misunderstanding. And so that's, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> that's one of the things we're trying to do. That's sort of the sort of more serious side of the Buzzkill Institute. Did I, uh, uh, Kara is asking what yeah. movies do I think do the most disservice to history? Almost all of them. I, I got to add, besides 300. Oh, well, I never saw 300. <laughs> it's the most, uh, it's, it's my like favorite, it's my, it's, it's my favorite hilariously, historically inaccurate um, uh, oh, movie of all time. But, I believe you. But yeah, sorry, back, uh, back to you. Kara brings up Braveheart. <laughs> yeah, Braveheart is also, well, I don't remember Braveheart very well. We should do a show on Braveheart. And what I, the reason why I won't, I won't discuss Braveheart is because I need to go and do my research first. And I always stress this when I talk on the media. I, I, you know, I think you ought to hear a lot more from people I don't know yet. And so I need to go back and do my work on Braveheart before I make big pronouncements. But that's a, that's a good question because Braveheart is very popular. I just went to a party in November. Braveheart was playing all over the place. It was a Scottish independence party. Let me give you an example that goes along with this hidden voices sort of theme. And that is the uh, Enigma movie of a few years ago, the, the imitation game with Benedict Cumberbatch and Kieran Knightley and a bunch of other people, which more or less gives a sort of Scooby-Doo and the mystery, magical mystery bus or whatever that was called version of the cracking of the Enigma code. It was this group of five people who heroically did it all on their own, you know, without any help and uh, against all sorts of odds, tensions from within the British government, tensions from within the British military and on and on and on. And it's just literally, literally not true. There were thousands and thousands of people who worked on Enigma. Polish cryptographers cracked Enigma, the Enigma code the first time. Alan Turing relied on their work, went to, uh, and, and and talk to Polish cryptographers who escaped Poland when the war was over, when the war started, uh, and had them work with him. Uh, people in the United States, including a man named one of my favorite people in history, Joseph Detch, from Ohio, who was one of the uh, head, he's the head of research and one of the important researchers at, wait for it, National, the National Cash Register Company. And now the National Cash Register Company is involved with the Enigma project because. Cash registers, cash registers inside have rotors, which is exactly how the German Enigma machine worked. Now, the cash register is a highly simplified version, but Joseph Detch and NCR and a lot of other people here in Britain, Poland, elsewhere, were all working on what are sort of prototypes for modern computers. So all of them had a tremendous impact on, on uh, breaking Enigma, but perhaps the most important people I would argue the most important people were the Wrens, the Women's Reserve Auxiliary. Uh, it's a Women's Reserve Auxiliary Na Naval um, um, secretaries and cryptographers. Well, not cryptographers, but they would code the messages. They would decode the messages from German and from. They would not decode. They would translate the messages into numbers. And they're the ones who who discovered that the Germans were were not. It wasn't the great mathematical it wasn't the great computational developments at bletchley park that cracked the code it was the fact that these again thousands of wrens working uh figured out that the german uh code uh the, the cipher guys in 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 the submarines at home in germany were sending out the messages were making mistakes they were getting sloppy they were including little uh, words like their girlfriend's name or whatever whenever they wanted to it wasn't this high sort of German efficiency that comes down from the top and Enigma's uncrack uncrackable. Because the Germans were making mistakes, they, the, the Wrens noticed it first and said, oh, wait a minute. This guy says Merry Christmas every, you know, every, every uh, 
Cody sends out in December. So, so they're able to work backwards that way and crack the code. And I argue that over and over again about a thousand different historical events. The, 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 the fighters at D-Day, the, the members of, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the regular people, if you will, the unsung heroes are the ones who more often than not crack these codes, win these battles, are the turning point or the, or the I don't know, the turning, uh, uh, the catalyst for important change. So if you're going to say anything about the 300, the movie uh, being historical, I would say the most important thing about the 300 is that there are 300 heroes rather than two or three famous Spartans. And that's one. That's the problem. The, the Scottish independence movement is back in the in William Wallace's time is extremely important, extremely broad based. And William Wallace was one of all only you know a couple hundred people who are equally important to to that part of uh, the Scottish history. So um, we've got a couple more questions and only three more minutes. Sadly, uh, this time has flown by. So Kara asks, um, I enjoyed your podcast episode where you interviewed Professor Nash on Spanish Civil War. What are some of the biggest misconceptions you've seen on how people throw around with this topic? What do you? Th uh, why do you think there is still a cult of personality in some extent around dictators such as Franco? I think it because it's an easy answer that people understand. They say, "Well, we don't like Franco, but..." He was organized and he got things done and he supported the church. Okay, it wasn't this sort of uh, vague Spanish Republic. Right? You see this, for instance, with Mussolini, even though people in theory, at least, sh do and should rail against Mussolini, they say things like, well, he, he made the trains run on time. Well, in point of fact, he didn't make the trains run on time. The Italian trains did not run better under Mussolini than they had run under the Italian Republic before he took over. It's just this sort of urban legend grows up around a single person, right? And so, Mussolini, you know, we don't want we don't want uh, uh, dictators and totalitarians, but you know, sometimes every now and then you need one of those to get things straight. So we reach out and we grasp a famous businessman and a guy who seems like he's going to kick ass and take names, and we say, well, we need him, right? Because uh, you know we don't like him, but after all, Mussolini made the trains run on time. And again, it's not true. It's the cult of personality. It's the cult of individuality. And we see it. It goes, it's in every culture, almost every culture, and all the way back through time. People seem to need heroes and individual heroes. And I think that's, that's a much more problematic thing than it is a good thing. I, uh, oh gosh, okay, we only have one minute left. Whew. Okay, so uh, last question from J.E. Young is, has Maya Angelou ever corrected those misquoting her as saying the bird sings dot, 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 unlike Gandhi, she's around to correct the misconception? Yeah, she did, yeah. She was the one, in fact, I don't know if she told the post office first or if uh, if Joan Anglin Walsh, uh, Joan Walsh Anglin told them first, but yes, she did. But, the, you know, it's one of these things, it gets stuck to you and there's 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 nothing you can do. And the post office said we're not going to take it off the stamp, which is just just remarkable. Like they could have taken any number of her other famous uh, lines of, of from her literature, but they just didn't. It's this inertia. Once you start uh, attributing these quotes to somebody, it just stays that way forever. I'm I am with thirty seconds left. I am I am I'm kind of ashamed that I didn't make it clear that this was uh, this is just Professor Buzzkill's show because as soon as everyone realized that it was just you, all the questions started lighting up. I'm sure there's a lot more um, a, a lot more you want to ask him. I know that you can. Um, can they contact you on your website, Professor Buzzkill? Absolutely, and email me at professor Bu info at professorbuzzkill.com. Professor at professorbuzzkill.com and hate mail at professorbuzzkill.com. <laughs> they all get to me and I will, and, and, and believe it or not, I'll say this, I'll admit this to the podcast world, to the intelligent speech world, that no one ever talks to me. No one, no one, very few people comment, very few people send me suggestions. If you email me, I'll e respond immediately. <laughs> and if you have want, want a specific show about something, tell me. I'll, I'll, I'll love you forever. I desperately need suggestions and help. Um, I, I checked out Professor Buzzkill's site. There's a ton of stuff that he's going through right now from the Confederacy to slavery to Hong Kong. Um, and, uh, and, and all of it is super prescient, super important stuff. Um, I recommend you guys go check it out. Uh, Dr. Kuhill, thank you so much. I'm sorry our time was so short. 
Um, it was a pleasure having you and, uh, and thank you. Uh, yes. And to the audience, thank you all so much for joining. Well, thanks for inviting me. It's great. I love intelligent speech. It's a great group. Absolutely. All right. On to the next show, everyone. Go grab your bathroom breaks. We'll see you in five minutes.